Okay, so who's ready for the next few chapters of Lassie Come Home? We are going to start in chapter three and see how far we can get. So here is a picture, the beginning of the next chapter, which is titled, An, Even T An Evil Tempered Old Man. Hmm. The Duke of Redling stood by a rhododendron hedge and glared about him. He lifted his voice again. Heinz, he roared. Heinz, where has that chap got to? Heinz! At that moment, with his face red and his shock of white hair disordered, the Duke looked like what he was reputed to be, the worst-tempered old man in all of the three ridings of Yorkshire. Whether or not he deserved this reputation, it would seem sufficient to say that his words and actions earned it. Perhaps he was partly due to the fact that the Duke was exceedingly deaf which caused him to speak to everyone as if he were commanding a brigade of infantry on, on parade, as indeed he had done many years ago. He had also a habit of carrying a big blackthorn walking stick, which he always waved wildly in the air in order to give emphasis to his already too emphatic words. And finally, his bad temper came from his impatience with the world. For the Duke had one firm belief, which was that the world was going, as he phrased it, to pot. Nothing ever was good these days as it had been when he was young when he was a young man. Horses could not run so fast, young men were not so brave and dashing, women were not so pretty, flowers did not grow so well, and as for dogs, if there were any decent ones left in the world, it was because they were his own in his own kennels. The people could not even speak the king's English these days, as they did when he was a young man, according to the Duke. He was firmly of the opinion that the reason he could not hear properly was not because he was deaf, but because people nowadays had got into the pernic pernicious habit of mumbling and snipping their words instead of saying them plainly, as they did when he was a young man. And as for the younger generation, oh, the Duke could and often would lecture for hours on the worthlessness of everyone born in the 20th century. This last was curious, for all of his relatives, the only one the Duke could stand, and who could also stand the Duke, it seemed, was the youngest member of his family, his 12-year-old granddaughter, Priscilla. It was Priscilla who came to his rescue now, as he stood waving his stick and shouting beside the rhododendron hedge. Dodging a wild swish of his stick, she reached over and pulled the pocket of his tweed Norfolk coat. He turned with bristling mustaches. Oh, it's you, he roared. It's a wonder somebody finally came. Don't know what the world's coming to. Servants no good. Everybody too deaf to hear. Country's going to pot. Nonsense, said Priscilla. She was indeed a very self-contained and composed young lady. From her continued association with her grandfather, she had grown to consider both of them as equals, either as old children or as very young grown-ups. What's that? The Duke roared, looking down at her. Speak up, don't mumble. Priscilla pulled his head down so that she could speak directly into his ear. I said, nonsense, she shouted. Nonsense, roared the Duke. He stared down at her and broke into a roar of laughter. He had a curious way of reasoning about Priscilla. He was convinced that if Priscilla had pluck enough to answer him back, then she must have inherited it from him. So Duke felt much in a much better temper as he looked down at his granddaughter. He flourished his, wild, his long white mustaches, which were much grander and finer than the kinds of mustaches that men manage to grow these days. Ah, oh, glad you turned up, the Duke boomed. I want you to see a new dog. She's marvelous, beautiful, finest collie I ever laid my eyes on. She isn't so good as the ones they had in the old days, is she? Priscilla asked. Don't mumble, roared the Duke. Can't hear a word you say. He had heard perfectly well but had decided to, decided to ignore it. Knew I'd get her, the Duke continued. Been after her for three years now. Three years, echoed Priscilla. She knew that that was what her grandfather wanted her to say. Yes, three years. Ah, he thought he'd get the better of me, but he didn't. Offered him 10 pounds for her for three years ago, but he wouldn't sell. Came up to 12 the year after that, but he wouldn't sell. Last year, I offered him 15 pounds, told him that it was rock bottom limit. And I meant it too, but he didn't think so. Held out for another six months. And then he sent word last week that he'd take it. The Duke seemed pleased with himself, but Priscilla shook her head. How do you know she isn't, cop isn't coped? 
This was a natural question to ask, for, if the truth must be told, Yorkshire men are not only knowing about raising dogs, but they are sometimes alleged to carrying their knowledge too far. Often they exercise devious secret arts in hiding faults in a dog, perhaps treating her crooked ear, treating a crooked ear or a faulty tail carriage, so that this drawback is absolutely imperceptible until much later, when the less knowing purchaser has paid for the dog and has taken it home. These tricks and treatments are known as coping. In the buying and selling of dogs, as with horses, the unwritten rule is caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Hmm. But the Duke only roared louder when he heard Priscilla's question. How do I know she isn't coped? Because I'm a Yorkshireman too. Know as many tricks as they do and a few more to boot, I'll warrant. No, this is a straight dog. Besides, I got her from, what's his name? Caraclaw. Know him too well. He wouldn't dare try anything like that on me. Indeed not. And the Duke swished his great blackthorn stick through the air as if to defy anyone who would have the courage to try any tricks on him. The old man and his grandchild went down the path to the kennels, and there, by the mesh wire runs, they halted, looking at the dog inside. Priscilla saw, lying there, a great black, white, and golden, golden sable collie. It lay with its head across its front paws, the delicate darkness of the aristocratic head showing plainly against the snow whiteness of the expansive ruff and apron. The Duke clicked his tongue to signal the dog, but she did not respond. There was only a flick of the ear of the ear to show that the dog had heard. She lay there, her eyes not turning toward the people who stood looking at her. Priscilla bent down and clapped her hands, called quickly, Come, Collie, come over here, come see me, come. For just one second, the great brown eyes of the Collie turned to the girl, deep brown eyes that seemed full of brooding and sadness. Then they turned back to mere empty staring. Hmm. Here is a picture. Here's Priscilla and the Duke and Lassie. Priscilla Rose. She doesn't seem well, Grandfather. Nonsense, roared the Duke. Nothing wrong with her. Heinz, Heinz, where is that fellow hiding? Heinz, coming, sir, coming. The sharp nasal voice of the kennelman came from behind the buildings and in a moment he hurried into sight. Yes, sir, you called me, sir? Of course, of course, are you deaf? Hines, what's the matter with this dog? She looks off color. Well, sir, she's a poor feeder, the kennelman hurried to explain. She's spoiled, I, sh I should say. They spoils them in them cottages, feeds them by, and with a silver spoon, and you might say, but I'll get, but I'll get, she see, <laughs> I'll see she gets over it. She'll take her food kennel away. She'll take her food, kennel way, in a few days, sir. Well, keep an eye on her, Heinz, the Duke shouted. You keep a good eye on that dog. Yes, sir, yes, sir, I will, Heinz answered dutifully. You better, too, the Duke said. Then he went muttering away. Somehow he was disappointed. He wanted Priscilla to see the fine new purchase that he had made. Instead, she had seen a scornful dog. He heard her speaking. What did you say? She lifted her head. I said, why did the man sell you his dog? The Duke stood a moment, scratching behind his ear. Well, he knew I'd reached my limit, I suppose. Told him I wouldn't give him a penny more, and I suppose he finally came to the conclusion that I meant it. That's all. As they went together back toward the great old house, Heinz, the kennelman, turned to the dog in the run. I'll see ye eat before I'm through, he said. I'll see ye eat if I have to push it down your throat. The dog gave no motion in answer. She only blinked her eyes as if ignoring the man on the other side of the wire. When he was gone, she lay unmoving in the sunshine until the shadows became longer. Then, uneasily, she rose. She lifted her head to scent the breeze, and if she had not read there what she desired, she whimpered lightly. She began trolling the wire, going back and forth, back and forth. She was a dog, and she could not think in terms of thoughts such as we may put in words. There was only in her mind and in her body a growing desire um, that was at first vague, but then the desire became plainer and plainer. The time sense in her drove at her brain and muscles. Suddenly, Lassie knew what it was she wanted. Now she knew. Hmm, what could it be? Here's the beginning of the next chapter. Lassie comes home again. 
When Joe Careclaw came out of school and walked through the gate, he could not believe his eyes. He stood for a moment, and then his voice rang shrill. Lassie! Lassie! He ran to his dog, and in his moment of wild joy, he knelt beside her, plunging his fingers deep into her rich coat. He buried his face in her mane and patted her sides. He stood again and almost danced with excitement. There was strange contrast between the boy and the dog. The boy was lifted above himself with gladness, but the dog sat calmly, only by the wave of her white-tipped tail, saying that she was glad to see him. <laughs> Wagging her tail. It was as if she said, what's there to be excited about? I'm supposed to be here and here I am. So what's so wonderful in all that? Come, Lassie, the boy said. He turned and ran down the street. For a second, he did not reason out the cause of her being there. When the wonder of it struck him, he pushed it away. Why question how this wonderful thing had happened? It was enough that it had happened. But his mind would not stay at rest. He quieted it again. Had father brought the dog back again? Perhaps that was it. He raced down High Street, and now Lassie seemed to catch his enthusiasm. She ran beside him, leaping high in the air, barking that sharp cry of happiness that dogs often can achieve. She stretched her mouth wide, as collies so frequently do in their glad moments, and in a way that makes collie owners swear that their dogs laugh when pleased. It was not until he was passing the labor exchange that Joe slowed down. Then he heard the voice from one of the men calling, Hey, lad, where'd you find that there dog again? The tones were spoken in the broadest Yorkshire accent, and it was in the same accent that Joe answered. For while in school, all the children spoke pure English. It was considered polite to answer adults in the same accents that they used. She were bit at school gate, Joe shouted. But after that, he knew the truth. Bye. She were by the to <laughs> she were but by the school gate. <laughs> I think I can say it wrong or right. His father had not bought the dog back again, or else all the men would have known it. In a small village like Greenall Bridge, everyone knew the business of everyone else. And certainly, in that particular village, they would have known about any such important matter as the resale of Lassie. Lassie had escaped. That was it. And so young jo Joe Caraclaw was glad no more. He walked slowly, wonderingly, as he turned up the hillside street to his home. By his door, he turned and he spoke to the dog sadly. Stay at heel, Lassie, he said. With his brow furrowed in thought, he stood about, he stood outside the door. He made his face appear blank of expression. He opened the door and walked in. Mother, he said, I've got a surprise. He held out his hand toward her as if this gesture would help him get what he most desired. Lassie's come home, he said. He saw his mother staring at him. His father looked up from his place by the fire, and then, as he came into the cottage, he saw their eyes turn to the dog that followed obediently at his heel. They stared, but they did not speak. As if the collie understood this silence, she paused a moment. Then she walked, going head down as a dog will when it feels that she's done something. It does not know what that is wrong. She went to the hearth rug and wagged her tail, as if in signal that no matter what sins had been committed, she was willing to make up again. But there seemed to be no forgiveness, for the man turned his eyes <clears throat> from her suddenly and stared into the fire. That way the man shut his dog from his sight. The dog slowly coiled herself and slank to the rug so that her body touched the man's foot. He drew it away. The dog lay at her head, lay her head across her paw and then, like the man, stared into the depths of the fire, as if in that golden fancy land there would be an answer to all of their troubles. It was the woman who moved first. She put her hands on her hips and sighed a long, audible sigh, one that was eloquent of exasperation. Joe looked at her, and then, to try to soften their stoniness, he began speaking, his voice bright with hope. I was coming out of school, and there she was, right where she always is, right at the gate waiting for me, and you never saw anyone as glad to see you. She wagged her tail at me. She was glad to see me. Joe spoke on, the words racing from him, as if... As long as he could keep on talking, neither his mother nor father could say the dreaded words that he expected to hear. With his flood of speech, he would hold back the sentence. I, I could see that she was homesick for us, for all of us, so I thought I'd bring her right along and we could just... No, was his mother interrupting loudly. It was the first word that either of the parents had spoken. For a second, Joe stood still, and then the words flooded from him again, 
making a fight for what he wanted and what he dared not hope that he could have. But she's come home, mother. We could hide her. They wouldn't know. We could say that we hadn't seen her, and then they'd know. His mother's voice repeated the words sternly. She turned away angrily and continued to set the table. Again, she found relief, as the village women did, in scolding. Her voice ran on, with the words coming cold and sharp to cover up her own feelings. Dogs, 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 she cried. I'm fair sick of hearing about them. I won't have it. She's sold and gone and done with, and the sooner she's out of my sight, the better I'll be pleased. Now get her out of here and hurry up. The first thing you know, we'll have the Heinz coming round here again, that know-it-all Heinz. Her voice sharpened with the last words, for she pronounced them in imitation of Heinz's way of speaking. The Duke of Rudling's kennelman was from London, and his clipped southern British accent always seemed to irritate the local people, whose speech was broad-voweled and slow. Now, that's my say, Joe's mother went on, so you might just as well put it in your pipe and smoke it. She's sold, so take her right back to them that's bought her. Feeling there was no help coming from his mother, Joe turned to his father sitting before the fire. But his father sat as if he hadn't heard a word spoken. Joe's under lip crept out stubbornly, for he sought as he sought for some new means of argument, but it was Lassie who argued for herself. Now that the cottage was silent, she seemed to think all trouble was past, and slowly she rose, going to the man, began nudging his hand with her slim muzzle, as a dog so often will when it wants attention and comfort from its master. But the man drew his hand away from the dog's reach and went on, staring into the fire. Joe watched that. He turned a soft argument on his father. Eh, father, he said sadly, you might at least bid her, bid her welcome. It isn't her fault that she's glad to be home. Just pat her. Joe's father gave no sign that he had heard his son's words. You know, happen they don't care for her right up at the kennels, Joe went on, as if speaking to the open air of the cottage. Do you think they understand how to feed her properly? Now, for instance, look at her coat. It does look a bit poorly, doesn't it? Father, don't you think... Just a bit of linseed strained through her drinking water would bring it up a little. That's what I'd do for a dog that couldn't stand a bit brighter coat. Wouldn't she, father? Still looking in the fire, Joe's father began nodding slowly. But if he did not seem aware of his son's attack, Mrs. Caraclaw understood it. She sniffed. Aye, she stormed at her son. That wouldn't be a Caraclaw nor a Yorkshireman if they didn't know more about tykes than breaking eggs with a, with a stick. Her voice droned on in the cottage. My goodness, sometimes it seems to me that the men in this village think more of their tykes than they do their flesh and blood. That they do. Here, hard times, and they do, and do they get work? No, they go on the dole, and I swear some of them will be quite content to let their own children go hungry as long as the dog gets fed. Joe's father shifted his feet uneasily, but the boy interrupted quickly. But truly, mother, she does look thin. I'll bet you anything they're not feeding her right. Well, she answered pertly, at that, I wouldn't past it. I wouldn't put it past Mr. Know-it-all Hines to steal best part of the dog meat for himself, for I never saw a skinnier-looking, meaner-faced man in all my life. During this flow of words, her eyes had turned to the dog, and suddenly her tone changed. By gum, she said, she does look a bit poorly. Poor thing. Better fix her a little summit. She can do with it. She can do with it, or I don't know dogs. Then Mrs. Caraclaw seemed to realize that her sympathies were directed were directly opposed to the words that she had been speaking five minutes before. As if to defend herself and excuse herself, she lifted her voice. But the minute she's fed, back she goes, she scolded. And when she's gone, never another tyke will I have in my house. All you do is bring them up and work them, and then there is much trouble as raising a child. And after all your work's done, what do you get for it? Thus, chattering angrily, Mrs. Caraclaw warmed a pan of food, and she set it before the dog, and she and her son stood watching Lassie eat happily. But the man never once turned his eyes toward the dog that had been his. When Lassie had finished eating, Mrs. Caraclaw picked up the plate. Joe went to the mantelpiece and took down a folded piece of cloth and a brush. He sat on the hearth rug and began prettying the dog's coat. At first, the man kept his eyes on the fire. Then, despite his efforts, he began to turn quick glances toward the boy and the dog beside him. At last, as if he could stand it no longer, he turned and held out his hand. That's no way to that's no way to do it, lad, he said, with his rough voice full of warmth. If you're off to do a good to do a job, you might as well learn to do it right. Sit up, like this. Sit up, like this. He took the brush and cloth from his son 
and kneeling on the rug, began working expertly on the dog's coat, rubbing the rich, deep coat with the cloth, cradling the aristocratic muzzle carefully with one hand, while the other, with the other, he worked over the snow white of the collie's ruff, and aristic, aristically fluffed, aristically fluffed out the leggings and the apron and the petticoats. So for a spell, there was quite happiness in the cottage. There was quiet happiness in the cottage. A man lost all other thoughts as he gave his mind over to the work. Joe sat on the rug beside him, watching in turn the turn of the brush and remembering it, for he knew, as in fact every man in the village knew, that there was not a man for miles around who could fix up a collie either for workday or for show bench as Sam Caraclaw, his father, could. And his greatest dream and ambition was to be, some day, as fine a dog man as his father was. It was Mrs. Caraclaw who seemed to remember first what they had all driven from their minds, that Lassie no longer belonged to them. Now, please, she cried in exasperation, will you get that tyke out of here? Joe's father turned in sudden anger. His voice was thick with the Yorkshire accent that deepened the speech of all the men in the village. You wouldn't have me taking her back looking like a mucky Monday wash, would you? Look, Sam, please, the woman began. If you don't hurry her back, she paused and they all listened. There was the sound of footsteps coming up the garden path. There, she cried in exasperation. It's that Heinz. She ran toward the door, but before she reached it, it opened and Heinz came in. The small, thin figure in its checked coat, riding breeches, and cloth leggings halted for a moment. Then Heinz's eyes turned to the dog before the hearth. Oh, I thought so, he cried. I just thought as how I'd find her here. Joe's father rose slowly. I were just cleaning her up a bit, he said ponderously, then I were off to bring her back. I'll bet you were, Heinz mocked. You were going to bring her back. I'll bet you were, but it would just so happens that I'll take her back myself since I happened to drop in. Taking a leash from his pocket, he walked quickly to the collie and slipped the noose over her head. At the tug, she rose obediently and, with her tail down, followed the man to the door. There, Heinz halted. You see, he said in parting, it wasn't born yesterday and I, I wasn't born yesterday and I happen to know a trick or two myself. You Yorkshiremen, I know all about you and your come home dogs, training them to break loose and run home back, back when they're sold. So then you can sell them to someone else? Well, it won't work with me, it won't, because I know a trick or two myself, I do. He suddenly halted, for Joe's father, his face deep red with anger, had started toward the door. Er, good evening, Heinz said quickly. Then the door closed and Heinz and the collie were gone. For a long time there was silence in the cottage and then Mrs. Caraclaw's voice rose. I won't have it, I won't, she cried, walking into my house and home without so much as a by your leave and keeping his hat on if he thinks he's the very duke himself and all account of this dog. Well, she's gone and if you ask me, I say good riddance. Now happen that we have to have a little peace. I hope I never do see her again, I do. As she scolded, her tongue ran on and Joe and his father sat before the fire. Now both of them stared into it, unmoving and patient, each bearing his own thoughts inside himself, as the North Country people do when they are deeply troubled. And I hate to stop it there at such a sad point, but that is the end of the chapter. And we have run out of time. <laughs> you guys have a great rest of your evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye.